All right, well, first, let me just kind of introduce this class just a little bit. Uh, the intent <coughs> of the next four weeks is that all of us would be even more convinced, probably than we already are, more convinced that, you know, what the truth is regarding God, the Bible, and Jesus. And if there are any doubts in our mind, to put those to rest. And my hope is that by just simply using, you know, basic logic um, and taking an honest look at the evidence that's out there, that we'll be able to see that um, there's only one belief system that reflects reality. Now, the way that things really are, and that belief system is Christianity. Um, that is, it's not just another set of beliefs like all the others, it's reality. And to do this, will first establish that there is such a thing as absolute truth, uh, something that is true for everyone. Then we'll talk about what that absolute truth is regarding God. You know, does he exist? What is he like? Next, if there is a God, then what reason do we have to believe that the Bible is his word? The Bible is God's word more than any other book. And then finally, if the Bible is God's word, what do we know about Jesus? What does it say about him? Who does he claim to be? And is it true? Uh, so we'll follow that progression, establishing the reality of truth, um, the truth about God, is the Bible his word, and who is Jesus? And the idea is to show that Christianity is not at all a belief that you have to just simply take on blind faith. Um, you can if you want, but there is a long list of very good, solid reasons to believe in Christ. I'm sure all of us have heard it. At times people say, yeah, Christians, they just, they just blindly believe the, the Bible. Uh, you know, an old, outdated, ancient document, um, biased. And, or Christianity is simply just a, a, a crutch for the weak-minded, for people who need something to help them through life. So they just simply make up a God. Poor Christians, you know, they're completely ignorant of the real world. That's the way a lot of times Christianity is perceived and what we're told. And on the one hand, it is true that um, our belief does require an element or a measure of faith, for sure. Uh, because no one can actually see God. No one. And no one can, you know, simply go and visit heaven or hell and confirm whether or not those places really exist. So yes, it requires faith. Um, and that makes sense. That's logical because if there truly is an invisible God who created everything, then we wouldn't be able to see him, right? Um, it's expected because he's invisible. So it's expected that it requires some measure of faith. There's no way around that. But that's true no matter what you believe. All systems of faith, so all systems of belief uh, require faith. Atheists need faith too be because they also can't prove for sure that there is not an invisible God. Uh, or a heaven and hell after death. If you can't see God, then how can you prove he doesn't exist? Um, if only those who die go to either heaven or to hell, then you know we can't ever know for sure until we die. Uh, that's uh, logical. So either way, it requires faith. A Christian has faith that God exists and is real, while an atheist has faith that God doesn't exist uh, and isn't real. So it's true for all belief systems. All require faith. No one has seen this God called Allah, and yet there are 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. No one can prove the existence of Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, or the many other Hindu gods, and yet there are 1.2 billion Hindus. So to, to some degree, every belief system about God and about what happens after we die requires faith. You can't 
give 100%, 100% proof that any belief system is true um, or that they're all false. You can't do that either. They deal with an unseen realm. They deal with life outside of this world, and we have no access to that. So yes, Christianity requires an element of faith. We know that. But it's no different than other beliefs. The key difference, I believe, is that Christianity actually has the most evidence to back it up. And therefore, it actually requires the least amount of faith. I know that sounds odd to hear, but it's it's true, I believe, because whatever is true is naturally going to have the most evidence and logic to support it. And it's just like in a courtroom. That's how people arrive at the truth. They follow all the evidence and see where it points, where it leads. Um, and that's the direction that they go. They want you want to, in a courtroom case, take all the guesswork out of it, take all the, the, the leap of faith out of it. You want to be confident. And so you follow the evidence, you follow the logic um, so that you can be confident. Which means that if you look at all the evidence around us, and if you are honest with that, then I believe, personally, that you actually will need much more faith to not be a Christian. Um, because the more you learn, the more you see that it all points to God and it all points to Christ. If you don't have much evidence to prove something, that's when you need a lot of faith. Um, because faith fills in the gap between evidence and a person's beliefs. It connects the two. For example, if you're only, let's say, 20% confident um, or positive about something, but yet you still believe it, that means that your belief is made up of 20% evidence, 80% faith. Because you've only got a little bit of evidence to back it up, so you have to connect from that big gap with faith. Um, so you could say 20% of evidence plus 80% of faith equals your belief. So that's a lot of faith to bridge the gap between evidence and your belief. However, if you have so much real, factual evidence that you're 95% certain about something, that means you only need a very little amount of faith in order to arrive uh, at your belief. You know, I've never seen Mount Rushmore, uh, but I believe it exists because I've seen many pictures. I've seen friends next to it. I've seen family next to it. I've heard them talk about it. I've read articles about it. Um, so there's a lot of evidence to support that it exists. It requires very little faith on my part to believe that it exists. It's not a st stretch of my imagination to, to arrive at that belief. So the more evidence you have, the less faith it requires and is needed. And that's what I believe that's like Christianity. There's evidence everywhere. And the more you know about it, all the evidence that supports it, the less a leap of faith you need to take because it just becomes more and more obvious what's true about God. Now, the reason all of this is important is because we will all be challenged, we are being challenged by, you know, challenged in our beliefs. So it's good to know about and be aware of all the evidence and, you know, the, the good logic that backs up our beliefs. We need to know why we believe what we believe, the, re the reasons why. We don't, number one, want to become an easy target. Um, Satan will attack our beliefs. He will try to put doubts in our head. He will use any means that he can. Um, so we can easily be misled and start to wonder, wait, well, I don't know. Uh, is Christianity really true? Have I just always just believed whatever my parents told me or, you know, people I've been around, and you start to doubt. It happens all the time. In fact, I think you're probably aware of this, that you know, kids grow up in the church a lot of times, but they're never taught how to defend their faith, 
and how much evidence there is to support their faith. And so they then go to college where pretty much no one follows Christ. Uh, professors mock Christianity and it just becomes too much and they walk away. Um, so it's important. It's important to know why you believe what you believe. In fact, it says in First uh, Peter 3.15, to always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So number one, to defend uh, your beliefs. Also, not only that, but you also want to be able to share your faith with anyone else who God brings into your path. The Bible also says in 2 Timothy 4.2, to preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Be ready to share God's truth at all times if needed. You never know when someone will come across your path. Um, God wants us to share our beliefs and share the gospel with those who will listen because they will have questions. So it's good for us to know answers, uh, supporting reasons behind our faith that we can share. Then we can clear up their doubts um, if we're ready and we can meet them where they are. And God can use that. Of course, we all know that logic and evidence by itself is not going to convince anyone to change their belief. That is, it's not going to cause them to be born again. Just having the logic and evidence uh, behind Christianity. Someone can give you and I, I know, I'm sure all of us have at, at some point been in this situation. Someone can give us undeniable proof that we're wrong about something and we can still be stubborn and not want to believe it. What? Human nature, yeah. <laughs> and it's just that. We're stubborn. We, we simply don't want to believe it. Because we've already made up our mind. Um, and it's hard to admit when you're wrong. Even when it's obvious. It can, and when it comes to, especially, your whole outlook and worldview and beliefs, it can especially be hard. Um, it can be humbling to accept Christ. And it can appear very inconvenient to your lifestyle, to your whole life altogether. And so a lot of people will balk. They will hesitate. Um... They count the cost, and they conclude that it's not worth it. Of course, obviously they're wrong. We know that. But at least if we can show them and share with them all the reasons and su support for what we believe, then at least they have to confront the real reason why they don't follow Christ. It's not because the evidence and uh, the good reasons aren't there. It's simply they don't want to. Uh, they are unwilling. The evidence is there, but they're not ready um, to make that. So in these situations, obviously, God's Spirit alone must work in the person to help them to change. We can't do it. It's a supernatural work of God in them. So first, what we need to do is to make it perfectly clear as a basis that absolute truth exists. We have to establish that before we go on to what's true about God, what's true about the Bible, what's true about Jesus. We have to lay that foundation that absolute truth exists. Something is true about God, and it's true for everyone, not just for certain people, everyone. We are told that it's all, you know, we've been told it's just a matter of preference, or it's a matter of opinion, um, you know, like food. You like steak, I like tacos, she likes macaroni and cheese, same thing. You follow Christianity, he prefers atheism, she dabbles in New Age. That's what we're told. It's just preferences. It's, that's all um, it is, some opinion. Not, there's no truth behind it. Or we're told that it's just a product of the culture that you come out of, or the family that you come out of, uh, or born into. You, you're born in Mexico? Oh yeah, of course. You're Catholic. Oh, you're from Saudi Arabia? Well, obviously, you're, you're Muslim. Um, you're from China? Let me guess, Buddhist. You, we, we think in this way that, oh, yeah, it's just a product of your culture, which culture may have an influence for sure, but none of those religions I just mentioned make the claim that these are just 
cultural truths, that they are confined to that specific culture. None of them do. They all claim to be transcendent truths, truths for everyone and for all of life. Um, so you can't say that it's just the product of, of culture. Uh, or we're told that only the physical world deals with reality. And th there's no absolute truth in religion, only what's personally true to you. Only science is real. The things that you can see and touch and nothing else, which is clearly wrong. Um, the physical world is not more real than the spiritual world just because you can observe it. That only means it's more observable. That's all. It's more observable, not more real. Otherwise, a tree is more real than your thoughts because you can observe the tree, but you can't observe <coughs> thoughts. Gotcha. Or you would then have to say that a rock is more real than the wind. Because you can only see a rock. You can't see the wind. You know, we can all testify that right now we're all having thoughts, right? Yes. <laughs> That's a lot of evidence. That's a lot of evidence. If we all testify the same thing that we're having, you know, that's a lot of evidence that there is such a thing as, as thoughts and thinking. Um, but yet we still can't see it. But a lot of evidence supports the reality that we do have thoughts. Um, and, you know, we have all seen firsthand the effects of the power of wind. The immense damage it can cause. So there's a ton of evidence uh, behind the fact that wind, uh, reality that wind is real as well. As well. So clearly something can be real even though you can't observe it. It's just as real. It's just not as observable. So you could say the physical world is defined as reality we can see, while the spiritual world or the unseen world is simply a reality we cannot see. What about tolerance? As Christians, is it really helpful for, you know, people will ask, is it really helpful for us to disagree with people and then share our beliefs? Shouldn't we just be more tolerant and say that all beliefs are equal? No. Um, because think about it. What does tolerance actually mean? And the real definition of tolerance is that you know, to be willing to get along with, be kind to those who believe differently than you. To be kind and courteous despite your differences. So you first have to have some sort of disagreement about something in order to even have the opportunity to be tolerant. You know, without differences... There's no need for tolerance. But now we're being told today that the meaning of tolerance is that we must agree. We must agree that all beliefs are equally true um, when it comes to this spiritual and religion and everything. But if all beliefs are equally true, then there's no need to be tolerant. Because there's no differences. We're all in agreement. We agree with the same thing, that they're all equal. Um, so, so yes, we believe as Christians that tolerance is good. We do need to be respectful. We need to be kind. We need to be, you know, show patience or tolerance to those who have very different beliefs than ours. As Christians, we're called to that. We have no problem with that. We, we actually like tolerance. <laughs> Because unfortunately, many of the people who say that they promote tolerance are actually very intolerant. The most intolerant of anyone who doesn't agree with them. So they demand that you agree with their worldview or else they label you, what, a bigot, a hateful, a radical. Um, that's the opposite of tolerance, forcing someone to agree with you. That's not tolerance. What about the fact that our beliefs are exclusive? You know, why do we think 
as Christians, that we have the one <coughs> truth and every other belief is wrong. After all, there are many beliefs. And we're saying that they're all wrong except ours. Isn't that being arrogant? No. It's just being logical. It's just being logical. Everyone is exclusive with their beliefs. Everyone, not just Christians. Whether it's a Christian who believes that he or she has you know, the one truth about God, or whether it's someone who believes, believes that all religions are equal. They both think that they are right and that other, every other belief is wrong. They're both being very exclusive. Everyone is exclusive with their beliefs. That's what it means to have an opinion. That's what it means to have a belief on something. It means to exclude every other option, at least for the time being. You, know, you may stay open-minded and change it, but for the time being, you've excluded everything else and you've arrived at your belief. So having a belief itself is exclusive, whatever that belief is. And there's nothing wrong with that, uh, with believing that something is true and everything else that contradicts it is false. That's just being logical. You can still be very tolerant, very kind, very cordial. That's why it makes no sense to say that all spiritual beliefs are equally true because they all contradict each other on major points. And if they contradict each other, it's quite obvious they can't all be equally true. Christians say that Jesus is God and he died on the cross and rose from the dead. Muslims say that Jesus was only a prophet and that he never died on the cross. Jews say that Jesus was a false messiah and that he died, but he did not rise from the dead. Others say that Jesus never existed or he's an angel or he's a teacher, teacher or whatever, a lot of other opinions. That's a lot of contradiction. This is just one belief about the person of Jesus. But there are many differences, many contradicting beliefs among the major world religions or belief systems. Therefore, they cannot all be true. So one belief system must be true, and everything that contradicts it, therefore, must be false. Whatever that truth is, anything that contradicts it must be false. But why does it matter? Why spend so much effort trying to figure out what this one truth is? Because... Being wrong has some major consequences. If there is no God, or here's a question, is there no God, one God, or many gods? Well, if no God, then you're wasting your life with religion. If only one God, you shouldn't be worshiping idols. If many gods, you're completely misled by worshiping only one. Was Jesus a prophet, a false prophet, the Savior, or also God? Well, if he's just a prophet, you shouldn't worship a prophet. If he's a false prophet, you shouldn't listen to him at all. If the Savior, you need to repent and follow him. If he's also God, you need to worship him as well, not just follow his teaching. Is there a hell for the wicked, or are they just annihilated for neither? Well, if there is a hell, then I should make sure I and others don't suffer there eternally. If the wicked are just annihilated, then there's no need to scare them with these ideas of hell. If everyone goes to heaven, there's no need to say or do anything. Is salvation by faith, good works, or both? Well, if it's just by faith, then I should trust my entire salvation in Christ alone. If by good works, then I will be punished unless I earn my salvation. If by both, then I should make sure I don't leave out either part. Does prayer work? If not, I'm wasting a lot of time when I pray. If it does, I'm missing out if I don't. So you can see it has major, major consequences. Um, it makes a huge dif difference what we believe. It matters. It matters a lot. There is one truth and it matters a lot that we find out what that one truth really is is because there are never-ending consequences for being wrong. What about this? Is the truth even knowable? Can we even know? So, oh, let's say that there is truth, but can we even know what it is? This is where you get into the realm of the, the agnostics, you know, those who claim that, yeah, there, 
There might be an absolute truth about God, but there's no way of knowing what it is. We're just left with guessing. So there's no way, there's no reason to waste any time merely speculating. It's a waste of time. We can never know. Is that right or is it possible to know what the truth is? I believe that, yes, it, it, you, it, you can know truth. Truth is knowable. And I believe that everyone agrees with this fact, whether you realize it or not. Even the most brilliant philosophers of the Enlightenment era tried really hard to prove that truth about God, spiritual things, is not knowable. But I believe they only ended up contradicting themselves. David Hume was a Scottish historian and philosopher during the Enlightenment period. And he suggested the idea that only the physical world that we can see and touch can, only there can we determine things to be true. All other so-called truth is meaningless. So he developed this principle, this principle of empirical verifiability, which stated that nothing is true or meaningful unless it is true by definition or can be tested and proven true by an experiment. Otherwise, you just you can't say it's true or meaningful. So one plus one equals two, that's true. A square has four sides, that's true. These are by definition. An ocean is a body of water, that's true. It's by definition. There's a God we can't see? No. He would say that belief is meaningless. Because it's not true by definition, it's not true by an experiment you can carry out and prove. Uh, the problem is, though, that Hume's own definition or his own principle itself must therefore be meaningless. It's self-contradicting. It's nothing more than just his opinion. His principle of empirical verifiability itself cannot be proven true by definition or by an experiment and tested. And therefore, if it cannot even live up to its own standard, then it is a meaningless statement and it's not true in his own definition. It's just, it's just his opinion that he has come up with. But you can't say, oh, I know that is true by... Um, by definition or by uh, some experiment. So his own definition of meaningful truth ruled out his own definition of meaningful <laughs> truth. <laughs> and then you have Immanuel Kant, a German philosopher and one of the most influential Enlightenment thinkers. His belief was that nothing <coughs> but perception enters our mind. Nothing but perception enters your mind. The real world does not ever enter a person's mind, only their perception of it. He said that everyone perceives things differently, so it's impossible to arrive at the truth and to know what it is. Um, and therefore, nothing is truly knowable. But this principle contradicts itself as well. Because if only perception enters your mind, then this principle of Immanuel Kant's is only his perception, not the real truth. So his principle falls apart as well. How can he say that we can't know anything for sure about the real world and then tell us something he knows for sure <coughs> about the real world? Unless you can see both the real world and your perception of it, that's the only way you can draw a distinction, draw a line between the two, and say which enters your mind or not. But if both of you can see both, then the real world has entered your mind. So another problem with his, his principle is that, again, unless you can see both the real world and your perception of it, that's the only way you can distinguish between the two, but then if you can see both, that means the real world has entered your mind. So again, the principle is wrong. So both David Hume and Immanuel Kant contradict themselves, even though they tried very hard to
to show that it is impossible to know the truth about God. They failed. So number one, it is tr undeniable that something is true about God. That's what we have to find out. <clears throat> and this something is knowable. You can't get around it. Truth is knowable. Okay, but then how can we find out what the truth is? How certain will, can we be? The Bible set, says that it's not hard. It really isn't hard to figure out if you really want to know. There's plenty of evidence for God's existence. In Romans 1, 19 to 21, it says this, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them, the people of this world. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. <coughs> so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. This passage lists two lines of evidence. The most obvious evidences for God. Number one, his eternal power. And number two, his divine nature. His eternal power and his divine nature. That, that means we can all conclude that there must be a powerful God in order to create this vast universe. And he must be a righteous God because I have a conscience inside me telling me there's good and evil. Um, and he must have put that in me. So this is evidence that is available to everyone, all people from all time. And the truth is there's more evidence of this than this, and we will look at this especially next week. But here's the point. If there is only a little evidence for the existence of God, then of course we couldn't be very certain. However, if there's a large amount of evidence... And if most of the evidence points towards the existence of God, then we can have a very high degree of certainty on this question. What's the truth about God? We already talked about how we can never have 100% proof. We can never have 100% truth because we can't see God. That's where faith, faith is a part of our beliefs. But if there is a lot of evidence for God, then we can have a very high degree of certainty, over 90%. Like I mentioned earlier I've never seen Mount Rushmore, but there's lots of evidence that it exists. Most of us, probably none of us, I don't know, have seen the Great Wall of China. Has anyone seen it? Been there? In person? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, so for most of us, we haven't seen the Great Wall of China, so we can't say 100% we know that it exists, but we've seen many pictures of it, we've seen videos of it, we've read about it, we've heard uh, people talk about it who have seen it, so we have a high degree of certainty that it does exist, even though we haven't seen it personally. Or Abraham Lincoln. There's an enormous amount of evidence for him having lived, being a real person, being one of our presidents, being a major part of our country's history, so we can have a very high degree of certainty that he did exist, even though we haven't seen him. Nobody can prove it beyond all doubt. So it's very clear that there are certain things that we cannot know the truth about with absolute certainty. The existence of God is one of them. But we can still know the truth about it with a very high degree of certainty. And that's what I want to hopefully do the next few weeks, is look at all the evidence around us and follow it to its logical conclusion and see that we can be highly certain about the question of God, and of the Bible being his word, and of Jesus being who he claimed to be. So, just as a summary, every belief about God includes some measure of faith. Because he is an invisible God who can't be seen, and heaven and hell are only dealing with life after death. Faith fills in the gap between logic and evidence, and your belief. So the less logic and evidence you have be, to support it, the more faith you need. The more logic and evidence you have, the less faith you need to arrive at your belief. Why is evidence important? To not be misled when you are challenged, when Satan attacks, to defend your beliefs, uh, same thing. 
to share our beliefs with others who are interested. Logic and evidence helps when you share it with someone, but it doesn't save anyone. Only the, the Spirit does. The Spirit of God. He causes someone to be born again. What's real? The physical world and the spiritual world. One is just observable and the other is not. Tolerance is kindness in spite of disagreements, not forcing people to agree. Everyone's beliefs are exclusive. That's what it means to have an opinion on something. You exclude all other options. All spiritual beliefs are not equal. It's impossible. They contradict each other. And we can know the truth about God. And we can know it with very high certainty. Just follow where all the evidence leads. Finally, three points to leave with. Truth exists and everything that contradicts it is false. If you disagree with this statement, then you are proving that you actually agree because you are saying that it is false because it contradicts what you believe is true. Number two, truth is knowable. If you disagree with this statement, then you are proving that you actually agree. You are saying that you know that something else is true. Number three, we can know with high certainty what the truth is. If you disagree and give several reasons why, you are proving you actually agree because you are giving evidence that has led to you to a high certainty that what you believe is true. So these are undeniable truths. That truth exists, everything that contradicts is false. Truth is knowable, and you can know with high certainty when you follow the evidence.